All right, good morning, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get this joint committee session started. Uh, this is a joint committee session of our Public Safety Committee and Health and Human Services Committee. I want to welcome my colleague and friend, Councilmember Navarro, who's been on the front lines on this issue for many years and has been such a leader. And I want to make a couple of announcements up front. The first is our council president um, has to leave this morning because he is testifying in Annapolis regarding the Kerwin Commission. So if he leaves, uh, in the middle of uh, discussions, that is why uh, he has an excused absence. Um, and I also want to say if my colleagues uh, Glass, Rice, and myself are a little slow this morning, uh, it's because we participated in the county's point in time homeless count last night and each of us got home around four o'clock this morning. Um, but I do want to acknowledge just up front, and it's in some ways connected to the issue we're discussing today. Um, what incredible work our nonprofit sector, our Health and Human Services Division, and the army of volunteers that go out once a year uh, to conduct this critically important count uh, that helps serve as the baseline for both a policy perspective, but also uh, how better we can serve our community. It was a powerful and enlightening experience for me. It was the second or third time Council Member Rice had done this, and the second time Council Member Glass had participated, and I also want to acknowledge Dr. Raymond Crowell, our illustrious director of HHS, who was also with us last night. And we, we were given the opportunity to do an abridged version of the count. All of us decided to do the whole thing. Uh, and so it was, it was uh, a, a tremendous experience, and I just want to acknowledge that up front. But if I'm a little slow this morning, that's why. Um, the way we are going to structure our discussion today, because we're going to hear from many uh, incredible panelists regarding a complex issue is we're going to first hear from our public safety representatives. We will then hear from more of our intervention-based HHS representatives, and then we will hear more on the prevention-based side. Although uh, intervention suppression and prevention, I know personally, are all connected uh, in many ways. Uh, to frame this in a way that makes sense, we're, we're going to uh, do that. So if I could please invite the representatives from the various public safety institutions, state's attorney, park police, MCPD, uh, to the table. I would appreciate that. And as they are coming to the table, I, I also want to acknowledge that this is an issue that I, I'm, I'm quite familiar with. Uh, going back to my days working in the nonprofit sector, helping to initiate the gang intervention partnership in Prince George's County in the Langley Park area. And I know, as all of my colleagues do, just how complex this issue is. Uh, as a result of our failed federal immigration system, as a result of international turbulence and economic unrest, uh, there is only so much the county can control when it comes to the gang issue. Um, but I'm very proud of what has transpired for a number of years now, and our county, like in so many other ways, has set the tone and the example for other jurisdictions to follow. It's not to say that the work is complete. It probably, unfortunately, never will be. Um, but we have a strong foundation from which to work from, and I look forward to the discussion this morning. So if you could each please introduce yourself, and then we will start with Chief Jones. Um, but if you could each first introduce yourselves. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Marcus Jones, Montgomery County Police. Good morning, Lieutenant Ruben Rosario, Montgomery County Police. Good morning, Patrick Mays, Gang Division, State's Attorney's Office. Uh, John McCarthy, State's Attorney for Montgomery County. Good morning, Daryl McSwain, Chief of Park Police. Good morning, Angela Talley, Director of the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. <coughs> Fantastic. So, Chief Jones, why don't we start with you? So, uh, good morning. Um, I just want to just uh, briefly say, and then I'm going to turn the, the, this over to uh, Lieutenant uh, Ruben Rosario, who oversees our gang unit, um, and has overseen them over the past couple of years, and, and really has a good uh, vibe on what's going on in our community. Um, we do have some, um, some good information to share that I think is relevant um, and important. And one of the things I think that is most important when we talk about whether we have gang-related homicides or we have gang-affiliated homicides, those people have a clear understanding of what that means because that can be some confusion. We have had incidents that have occurred over the course of this, uh, the, the last few years, the last three years, you may say, that involve uh, individuals who, are, who have been validated in our gangs. But, they, but the incident itself may not have, had, not have been 
from a gang perspective. Uh, it may be drug related. It could have had some other, uh, just a, a beef with an individual that's a non-gang member. So therefore, it had nothing to do with them uh, sort of embracing or enhancing the gang activity itself. So we want to make sure that we, when we talk about those types of things that have occurred in the county, we look at what's gang affiliated and not so much what's always gang related or gang motivated, you might say, um, in response to gang activity. So I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Rosario. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the council. My name is Lieutenant Ruben Rosario, as I said a moment ago, and I currently serve as one of the two deputy directors of our Special Investigations Division. Behind me is Captain Mike Ward, who heads up the division. Uh, for the past two years, I have been assigned to uh, the Criminal Enterprise Section, which amongst other units houses our, our Criminal Street Gang Unit. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the council for the trust and investment you guys made in us. Um, after seeing the spike in gang-related homicides in 2017, as well as the opportunity to come here today and um, be held accountable and have an opportunity to share some of the things that we've done to serve our residents since then. Uh, as a quick framework, I plan to tell you a little bit about the way we approach gang suppression. I'll do that as briefly as I can. Um, and then provide some data that presents a current picture of what we're facing today and address a few concerns that I believe you have based on uh, what has already been shared with me. So gangs, as you know, represent a distinct criminal element because they're made up of a network of criminals um, working as a group to some degree cooperatively uh, with one another. In response to that approach, um, led by our county leadership and our chief, we've done the same, and I'm proud to say that our network is strong um, and steadfastly committed to the task. Uh, as you know, for the past several years, the department has worked diligently to reduce the number of gang-related incidents that take place in Montgomery County. Uh, in that effort, we've observably committed ourselves to working in partnership with other government agencies, such as HHS and Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, as well as non-governmental organizations who are represented here, such as uh, Identity. Um, we've done that to present in, an informed, holistic, and responsible approach to gang suppression. Um, which includes helping in the areas of prevention and intervention, as has already been stated. Uh, it's important for the people that I have worked with uh, for us to know that you know that we strive to take an investigative, targeted approach to gangs, uh, which means that we're not interested in casting a very wide net, dangerous net, in order to catch a few fish. Uh, instead, through collaboration, uh, which you'll hear a lot about today, we seek to identify key players within criminal street gangs that negatively impact our county. Um, <clears throat> we work harder and more diligently to find those people that are both committing acts of violence themselves and motivating other more vulnerable people to do the same. Those are the people that we've uh, strived over the last several years um, to hold accountable first. Uh, to put it more plainly, the criminal street gang unit works hard to avoid things like labeling, over judgments, or any enforcement activities that whether they are effective in terms of making arrests, place our community in apprehension or fear of the police. Um, statistical uh, data that we have that we've collected over the past five years, we've seen gang violence within the county fluctuate from time to time. However, despite a few fairly sudden and short-lived peaks in certain categories, such as the number of homicides in 2017, the overall numbers have remained consistent. Uh, in order to provide a picture of gang crime, we currently track five crime types with a gang nexus, homicides, rapes, robberies, assaults, and weapons offenses. Uh, the following represents some notable increases and decreases. Uh, overall, gang-related violent crime decreased by 25% in 2019. Uh, this reduction uh, was primarily driven by a decrease in robberies, assaults, and weapons offenses. Uh, known gang-related robberies decreased um, it significantly in 19 with a 43% a 43% decrease. Uh, gang-related aggravated uh, simple aggravated and simple assaults increased from 17 to 18, but they subsequently decreased by 32% from 18 to 19. So that's another decrease. Uh, gang-related weapons offenses they increased a significant amount from 17 to 18, but in 19 we've seen them decrease by 23%. Uh, that, that explains the overall 25% decrease that we've seen in gang-related violence. Um, with respect to homicides, which um, obviously are paramount, um, we have six gang-affiliated homicides um, where there were, it, it was five incidents, but six people were, were killed. Um, <clears throat> to give you 
kind of a picture. Three of those occurred in, Silver, in the Silver Spring District. Uh, two occurred in the Germantown District. Um, and right now we have one of them as gang motivated, driven by the interest of the, of the gang. That one was in, in Germantown. Um, all but one of those incidents were related to hybrid gangs, which I'm sure you guys are well informed to know what that is, but really quickly, uh, we categorize gangs in sort of three ways, transnational gangs, neighborhood gangs, and hybrid gangs. Transnational gangs can be described as operating in multiple countries, tend to be larger, have a greater hierarchical structure, um, more of a threat because it's a larger network, in a sense. Um, examples of that are MS-13 and 18th Street. Neighborhood gangs are what they sound like, um, associated with a particular uh, community or um, residential community or uh, block, and they, um, that, that's essentially what brings them together. Um, and then hybrid gangs, which are characterized by having members of different racial or ethnic groups, um, individuals participating in multiple gangs, unfair rules of code or conduct, um, and several other things that make them a bit more difficult to deal with. We have a few of those here in the county. Um, I'll wrap up with this. Um, I know this was a concern, uh, crime committed by youth. So I'll give you the numbers for that. In terms of crime committed by youth, overall in 2019, 65% of known gang-related crime was committed by youth under the age of 22. Um, and that's slightly up from 18, where it was 61%. Um, in 2017, it was 75%, so still down, but um, high none nonetheless. With respect to gang-related robberies, 82 were committed by youth uh, in 2019. It was pretty much the same in 2018. And last thing, in terms of hotspots or geography, when it comes to youth, there appears to be a slight shift in the geographic location of gang-related crime committed since 2015. Um, between 2015 and 2017, gang-related crime that occurred in the northern part, northern part of the county was primarily in Gaithersburg. We have seen some of that grow in the Germantown district, so that's a significant shift. And then uh, we've seen an, a pretty noticeable increase in uh, the Lockwood Drive area when you talk about down county. That's what I have. Thank you. Um, I just had one question, and there will be more um, after the entire panel speaks, but this is specific to MCPD. Yes, sir. I know that there had been funding. Um, a lot of the activity now is much more subtle as compared to what it was, you know, seven, eight, ten years ago. Um, a lot of it is done vis-a-vis -vis social media. And I know MCPD is part of your enhancements to the gang unit, but also across MCPD has beefed up the operation to track social media. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and um, the, the, how that is going? And uh, are you seeing any dividends as a result of that enhanced in, in investment in the social media aspect of this? Yes, yeah, so um, you know, in terms of overall investment, the positions that you guys graciously gave us before and we uh, put to use, we applied those to, um, we, we structured our unit um, basically behind a disrupt and dismantle approach. So we created one, we have one unit, but it has sort of two teams, a two-pronged approach. So one unit is the gang investigations team, and their job is um, to establish connectivity with all of the districts and to disrupt the day-to-day -day activities of gang members by gathering intelligence and, um, you know, op conducting street-level operations. Um, the other team, the other side, if you will, is more focused on dismantling, which um, works in partnership with federal aid agencies as well as state attorney's office to try to utilize our most effective prosecutorial tools to extricate leaders of these gangs and decrease their Im influence within the communities that they prey upon. Um, <clears throat> the two analysts are a big part of what you're describing. They, um, we have a, cr a criminal intelligence and analysis unit. Um, those two analysts were, you know, put obviously under that particular unit and they do a ton of work um, how do I say, um, establishing link, links between crimes, links between people and crimes, identifying the leadership and the hierarchy um, of gangs. A lot of that does happen through um, op open source. Uh, we believe there's probably a lot more opportunity there than, um, you know, than, than our capability of finding it um, really has, but um, they've, they've done a lot there. I think we identify a lot of opportunities there, and I think we um, responsibly identify gang members through that. Uh, Councilmember Rice. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, one of the questions I have is in terms of collection of data when it comes to some of our uh, young people and whether or not we're inquiring about uh, whether or not they're employed and have any gainful employment. Is that something that we track at all in terms of 
finding out that information because I know that that is a key tenant to how a lot of folks get started in this without having a job, without having money, seeking an organization that says that they can get you something so that you can get some of the things that everybody else has that you want. That's a lot of their in. So do we track that kind of data and do we have any information in terms of what that might look like? Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Mr. Rice. Um, I, I, I appreciate um, the question related to data collection because it's something that we talk about on a regular basis. There are good and effective ways of doing that and then um, harmful ways also. So um, in, in short, we don't, we don't collect that, that particular data. We, we, don't, we don't collect whether someone is employed or not um, as a gang member or associated or recruited. We don't, we don't have that. Okay. And I think that would be helpful. Um, again, just anecdotally in terms of my conversations with folks, um, it, it, it's one of those that will be helpful for us in trying to address all of the reasons why uh, people decide to pursue gangs, and there are multiple reasons. Um, that may just be one, and it may be a small percentage, but it'd be helpful to just know. So mm -hmm. I think if we could uh, commit ourselves to trying to track that information, it would be incredibly helpful, especially with our conversations now around WorkSource Montgomery and what happens with us providing opportunities for children when it comes to uh, the minimum wage and our concerns around uh, young people and employment and what that would mean and the impacts. All of that information just will help us in terms of making sure that we can do our part to do some of the other things that we need to to address that issue as well. So thank you. Sure, thank you. All right, our state's attorney's office has a presentation and there's a PowerPoint in our packet. I think the first time you and I ever talked about gangs was about 15 or 16 years ago in your aunt's house yep. when I was introduced to you over a dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, the background you had with intervening with gangs, I think at the time in the District of Columbia. So, uh, may I say, I'm going to focus primarily on, um, in my presentation and the PowerPoint, what we did with the money that you gave us uh, in 17. Uh, there are, are, are other uh, intervention kinds of activities that my office is involved in, which I could talk about, which is truancy courts, safe teen dating, teen court, and things like that. I, I'm really going to confine my comments this morning specifically to where we were and what happened with the money that you gave us uh, beginning in 17. Uh, we, uh, I, I was alarmed, and I think a lot of people, there's some of the same people are here. When I came in, in, uh, in, in 17 and began to look at, and primarily I think what raised my concern as state's attorney for Montgomery County were the uh, alarming numbers in spike in homicides in Montgomery County, which, uh, which had traditionally been, when it came to gang-related homicides between the year 2000 and 2015, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then all of a sudden it seems like we had an explosion between 15 and 17, and that's why we began the conversation. I was always very grateful to the responsiveness of the council. In the PowerPoint uh, that I've provided to you, in terms of current structure, I think it's page three of, of, of the PowerPoint provided to you, uh, there is a chief of my gang unit, that's Patrick Mays, who sits next to me. There are three assistant state's attorneys, um, and there are two legal assistants assigned to that unit. That's the overall structure of the unit. Uh, the funding that you provided to me in 17 allowed me to uh, <coughs> fund uh, three of the five positions you see on this, this page. Uh, uh, I did transfer internally an additional attorney from my existing staff to this unit because I thought it was a priority for me. And we also uh, transferred someone, an, an additional legal assistant, but that's the complement right now. Five bodies are associated with it. Um, page four of the gang. Uh, in my gang unit handles, and I, th I think it actually parallels pretty much with what, Re what Ruben said in his comments. My gang unit is handling the same types of crimes that Reuben listed when he made his presentation to you. Uh, they, these, these are violent crimes or weapons offenses. Uh, this is not uh, to be distinguished with a term that we used years ago, an all crimes approach. I mean, not, you know, if you were an identified gang member and you got picked up for shoplifting, well, well, we're not capturing that number or it was a drunk driving. This is, this is essentially looking at, at violent crimes. Uh, as you look at 2017 to 2019, you know, you can always do whatever you want with numbers, but I think there's, a, there's a, an explanation for how these numbers appear on this page. You must remember that you gave us funding in the state's attorney's office after a hearing 
I mean, it might have been in the spring or the summer. You responded very quickly, quite candidly, and we were up and operating by uh, November of 2017. So the 31 number you see handled by my, num my office in 2017 was just November and December. All right, so you're not comparing apples and nor, you know, you're not looking apples to apples. In 2018, the number grows to 64. Now, I would also say, and I, I, I know the police, uh, they have, you know, uh, in terms of how they fill their spots, I can respond because I don't have union negotiations and other kinds of things I need to do before I can move my people around. They have, they live in a more complex world than I live. And so, uh, into, into 18, they were still not fully staffed. I, I think it's, uh, they, they can correct me on it, but I think it's about halfway through the year of 18 that the full complement of the state's attorney's people with the money you gave us and the police being fully funded with the, their, their, their uh, personnel in place comes. So, but you see the number grow, but that's, again, a full complement, about a half year's work. We're up to 64. The first real year, I think, you look at numbers in terms of what the investment has been is probably 219. Because by 219, I think they've got a full complement of people working. We've got a full complement of people working. And I think what we had envisioned maybe almost two years ago now, what we were going to do with this, we had, we had arrived, basically. So I think 2019, if you're going to do comparisons year to year, I would begin by comparing 19 to what happens in 20 and 21 and 22, more so than the other numbers. I don't think they're, they're not of much guidance to you. Uh, total cases by charge. Uh, and again, <laughs> what kinds of cases are we seeing? It's on the next page. You can see that uh, 60 of the cases that, that we've handled in, uh, and these, these are my internal <laughs> prosecutor numbers, all right? These are the, the cases handled by, by Pat's team. 60s were robberies, 33 uh, first degree assaults, uh, 11 attempted murders, 11 murders. Uh, and, and then you can see the other associated crimes if you want to know. Again, I would defer to the police in terms of the newer hot spots, but these are the kinds of crimes that we have been focusing in on, major violent offenses. If you go to the next page, uh, total ca ca cases by gang affiliation. Uh, far and away, uh, the, the largest number of, of cases that have been identified and prosecuted by us are by MS-13, which stands at 65. You can see there that you have hit squad bloods. You know, uh, Some of these are transnational gangs. Some of them are what we might call local cliques or smaller gangs that have been in existence off and on for, for many years in Montgomery County. Uh, but th those, are, those are your numbers. Uh, I will tell you that 65 does not include, and, uh, and like the police, we have partnerships with the U.S. Attorney's Office. There was a, a, a fairly large MS-13 federal prosecution where I think 25 members of MS-13 were I I included in a federal indictment Many of those cases came out of work done by Montgomery County. Many of those cases came out of Montgomery County. Uh, but that 65 number are internal cases to us. They, they do not capture the full range of criminal matters perpetrated in Montgomery County by any of these gangs, because in some instances, the federal authorities step in. And by federal indictment, in one indictment, they took 25 people. So again, not all from Montgomery County. Um, May I say that in terms of validation, I just want to remind you also, in terms of who is a gang member, who's not a gang member, uh, this has been an evolving process. I think pretty much everybody here probably knows this. That maybe, Mr. Glass, I've never said this directly to you before, but the way we validated gang members changed in the last six or seven years. We used to validate on a single criteria many years ago. If, if someone had said, I'm John McCarthy and I'm a member of gang, you know, the Irish Mafia, uh, you could be validated by your own admission, all right? Uh, we now have, there are federal criteria. I, I know that when, when, when uh, uh, Ruben has to uh, uh, upload into a federal database, there are criteria about which he's got to follow, and, and, and you, have to, you can't validate on a single criteria. So sometimes your numbers, sometimes when you go back historically and look at numbers, your numbers are not going to look and compare nicely to each other because how you defined gangs then, or affiliates, and how you define it now is a little different. And, and I, you know, there are different ways in which things have to be purged out of the system because they age out, and there are guidelines that they follow that, that, that change that. Um, we also, one of the, if I can just say this, 
with the additional resources I, uh, that they have, the police, as well as internally within our own office, uh, we're validating more people. I mean, I don't know that this should really surprise anybody, but the more resources you have, to, someone asked a question about social media, and I apologize. Uh, we do mine social media all the time. And, 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 and a lot of the intelligence, they put a lot of information out there for us to figure out what their affiliations are, who they're with, and, we, and, and sometimes we can find information on social media that will allow us to validate someone who previously wasn't validated because of some of the representations or associations they have on social media. Uh, as a result, the more resources you give us, the more people that are going to be validated, and this, the more people you validate, the more people you will validate. Because if the number becomes larger, all of a sudden he says, I, I didn't know Evan Glass was a member of a gang. But now all of a sudden I'm mining social media and I see he's, he's associating with Sid Katz. And, 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 and some, sometimes the, the, that's not the only way you do it. But again, the more you validate, the more you validate. I just, I, I, so, uh, gang numbers. And I know that we, uh, the 2015 to 2017 number, that's where, the, that's the shocking number. The tw and I think most of them were 16 and 17. Uh, and, and not all those, the, that, my number there does include, we, look, we had a freshman from, I know Mr. Katz, it's a young girl, freshman in high school, taken over Fairfax. We had another body that was a gentleman who was abducted in Montgomery County. His body was recovered, I think, in uh, Anne Arundel County. Another was up in Frederick County. We, we had people that, they were gang-related homicides, uh, but, and they were murdered by gangs, but their bodies were not recovered within the geographic boundaries of Montgomery County, but they were Montgomery County citizens, so maybe that number should be more. We had 26 people who lived and were residents of Montgomery County who died in that period of time. Uh, 2018 was a much better year, a much better year, and, 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 and I, I don't know if I should even say that, but, but I, I will tell you that some federal people said to us, because it was, there's a huge rivalry between 18th Street Crew and, and MS-13. He's not going to, I'm looking at this, he's smiling at me. And, and, and to, to some extent, there, there was some scuttlebutt about whether or not MS-13 uh, took off 2018 in greenlighting people to kill them. Because they didn't want to, in some backhanded way, pay a compliment to 18th Street Crew by killing people in 18. I know he's heard that before, mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and I will say that, so, so the question then becomes is, what, is it, was 18 a real number that you can rely upon, or was that an aberration because uh, MS-13 took the year off, and they were your prime, fe uh, okay, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that there are many people, that, a lot of federal people, they talk, people talk about it, they opine, I don't think anybody knows, necessarily knows enough. Now, if I'm looking at 26 people, from Montgomery County being lives being taken versus zero, I'll take zero every time, regardless of what reason you want to tell me it happened. And we're still, I think the numbers are still uh, much lower than before, and I guess the most recent, the young lady that was found in the upper county, that really started in the district, uh, and she was killed here, but it started down in, in, in D.C., and she was brought out here, and I think the actual the issue, the issue for us also was, with a lot of these cases, is when you find someone, we don't have geo, we don't have jurisdiction over a case if somebody's just simply dumped here. So the question, there's a very fundamental question, and, and that's a, the challenge to them: Did is this a dump, or was this someone who was actually murdered here, over which we have the, we have the jurisdiction over the prosecution, the investigation, the murder, or or we does it really go back to D.C.? And I think that was one of the first steps they had to decide in that particular case. Um, I will tell you, uh, extensive records, phone records, social media, uh, I will, the investment of money that you've given us, I cannot tell you how much we have gleaned and how much we have progressed by virtue of, we do listen to jail calls. Our, that's our, 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 our uh, legal assistants spend hours every day mining the information on the jail calls and it, Look, they're told that these lines are recorded, but I am telling you, people say things every single day that are valuable to us in identifying affiliations as well as providing information about cases that allow us to prosecute them. And thank God they do what they do. Um, 
Gang participation convictions. Well, uh, let, let me say this is the next page. This is uh, gang participation statute is a very complex statute that is for, uh, kind of akin to a RICO kind of statute at a federal level. It's very complex. The, the typical uh, criminal matter probably has three or four elements you have to prove. You've got to prove A, B, C, and D, and John's guilty. Uh, a a, a gang-related prosecution, I think, I counted up one time, I think there's 25 or 26 elements. And in order to prove that somebody's guilty under this gang-related statute, you have to prove not only the crime that they are currently charged with, you have to prove that they are a gang member and they have participated in a pattern of criminal activities, which means you have to prove a series of other crimes as well. It's almost like three or four trials in one. Um, when this bill was initially passed, it virtually went almost unused for about 10 years. And part of the reasons it was unused by local prosecutors' offices, they didn't have the resources to do the complex kind of uh, investigations that a lot of our federal partners did with RICO that took the mob and organized crime down, things like that. But as you now look at this, we've gone from 2017, we used the statute zero times. In the previous 10 years, I think we used it once or twice. In 18, we used it three times. Now, in 19, the first time that the police have a full complement and we have a full complement, we've used it 11 times. The bottom line is we are doing very complex, sophisticated criminal investigations. And I want to acknowledge the police for this together that we never did before. And it's helping us get much better information on it. And, and again, one of the things we are attempting or trying to do is to target uh, people at, uh, at leadership levels uh, who are doing the most violent kinds of crimes. Again, we're not looking for the low-hanging fruit. We're looking for the leaders, and we're looking for people who are committing crimes of violence in our community, destabilizing the, the, the way we are. Uh, we do have partnerships. The last page in my, in, in my presentation just kind of repeats what's already been stated to you. We all have partnerships. And we work with a lot of different agencies besides ourselves. And obviously, that includes uh, uh, the District of Maryland, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, Eastern District of Virginia, D.C., uh, ATF, FBI. We, we work with a multitude of different agencies. We share information as much as we possibly can because these are, these are regional problems. They're not going to, they just are. Obviously, we can't solve this by ourselves. We need regional partners to do it. And we reach out to our partners all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McCarthy. Um, there are two lights on. I had a quick question, um, or just if I could get while you're here, I know that you may have to leave in a little bit as well. Um, obviously, the relationship with the community and the element of trust is so critically important to both report crime, um, but also to help close cases, um, because you need critical pieces of information. And so that synergy between our government and our community is critically important and uh, has always been very strong here in Montgomery County. Um, this council and this body has, has taken a lot of heat over steps that we have taken in partnership with the executive branch uh, to ensure that our community understands that we value that trust. But if you could just briefly, and you as well, um, Chief Jones, talk about the importance of that relationship and that trust with the community in coming forward because as we know the current environment we're in with our federal system is making it more and more difficult for us to be able to continue to have that trust if you could just talk generally about that no, that'd be helpful it's very I, I really appreciate that question and i think that you know i think i'm coming up on 14 or 15 years being state's attorney here and, and we have constantly tried to reach out to all members of the community and particularly let's say the hispanic latino community uh, represented by the organizations you're talking about. And, and, I, and I will tell you that, uh, n number one, I have a rule in my office that if anybody asked a victim of a crime what their immigration status was, I would fire them. And I have preached re uh, religiously that when someone is a victim or a witness to a crime and you come forward to help us stabilize and, and keep our community safe, uh, we are interested only you in, in, in support protecting you and your family uh, as best we possibly can. We try to get that message out as much as we can. I think there's so much background white noise created mainly by the federal <laughs> partners, but also by surrounding jurisdictions that have different policies than we have. It's, it's 
really hard to, to, to get people to understand if you do things differently than your neighbors at either a federal or state level. It's hard to get that message out because what voice do you listen to? And I think that the, you just have to talk constantly about it and, 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 and hope that people understand that we are there to protect everybody. I, I, look, I, I firmly believe that if you don't protect every member of the community that lives in, in your community, you protect no one. That is an operating tenant that we have. It's the way we operate our office. That's the way I preach to, to the men and women that work for me. I think they understand that. Uh, it's, it's just a tough, I think it's a tough message, particularly because of the time that we are in, because there's too much other noise. Chief Jones. So I would echo uh, Mr. McCarthy's uh, comments in regards to that. Um, and I would also note that, um, you know, when we're doing these investigations, particularly in some of these, the tougher neighborhoods, um, and, uh, and, and immigration issues are, of course, are at foot, that we well are well aware of, but for us to be able to gain people's trust when you have uh, sometimes these gangs that are really creating havoc in these communities, they create they've created a level of fear that most people can't even can even imagine. Um, and when things happen in certain neighborhoods, and when you're trying to put together investigations um, and try to get cooperating witnesses. And it's vitally important for us to have that trust in order to be able to, to, one, for them to share the information, but B, there's a level of retribution that's real. Um, and people have to understand that, that when we talk about retribution, that there are people that oh, there will wholeheartedly, these gangs will, will make sure that they go after people who they think are cooperating with, the, with law enforcement. Um, and so we have to be able to be able to present them with the protection and the confidence to know that, that, that we will be there for them to make sure that these things don't happen. Um, and when we talk about even in some other communities where in realities you have people that don't even cooperate with us right from the very beginning, it makes it very difficult to, to handle gang-related invest investigations when people don't talk. The people that are involved, even the victims that might be gang members who don't want to because they're, they're, they've already decided that they're going to take street justice into their hands. And this creates, again, more of a challenge for law enforcement because we're going to end up at some point if we're not um, have inside information to be able to stop what's getting ready to happen. It's, it could likely happen. I um, mean, we're, again, we're, we're sort of, you know, following this continuous um, course of action that these individuals are going to continue to go after each other until they get what they want. And sometimes that could be never ending. Um, and we don't see that um, from a standpoint that it's a major issue in the county. But the problem is, is I can tell you in, in other jurisdictions that are very close by, they experience them often. Um, and that and we're not, um, there's no wall that's going to protect us that uh, keeps that type of behavior out. So that's just something to keep in the back of our minds. But we make sure that we want to make sure that whether it's victims or witnesses who are coming forward, that we're not engaging in them. And, you know, again, that's with our staying true to our policy about not engaging in any immigration discussions because that's not important to us. What's important to us is that we're protecting those folks uh, to the best of our abilities in the communities that we know are very vulnerable in many different ways. Thank you. Councilwoman Navarro. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, this, uh, this hearing as well as listening to, to all of you and really want to thank you for your service and everything that you are doing because these are not simple issues and we have had uh, so many different opportunities to hold these kinds of sessions um, where I know I feel you know, really proud of the fact that we have always been upfront. You know, we have not shied away or tried to pretend because we understand that the idea here is to be able to have the frank conversations and find the solutions. And I think this investment that has been illustrated here, I was trying to add really quickly, I mean, I know that just, you know, from FY16, you know, it was about, I don't know, $1.2 million roughly um, of just additional funding sometimes in mid-year to uh, make sure that we're responding very quickly. And I'm glad to hear that now everybody's staffed up and things, you know, can go forward. Um, but, you know, um, as it was stated, this, the noise is something that we have to be very, very careful. Um, and, you know, even as I'm listening to you, Chief, you know, talk about 
the importance of communities uh, knowing that they can trust our, our uh, law enforcement officials and the benefit that that brings to everybody in the county because the quicker that we can address many of these issues you know, that are affecting so many uh, community members, the better it is, which is why I think it's so important this conversation that we're having right now about community policing. It's so critical that we move ahead with understanding that this is an important component of everything that we do. Um, I also just wanted to ask, you know, where are we with the process of constant collaboration between all of you uh, and also obviously our street outreach network or our community-based organizations because we need to glean real-time information about what is it that we can continue to do to fill the gaps of prevention interventions, of obviously as well as the you know, enforcement and, and, and prosecution and things like that. But, but we really need to make sure that we're on top of that constantly. You know, Councilmember Rice alluded to the issue of workforce you know, and employment that seems to be so critical. Um, but there are other kinds of interventions because at the end of the day, what we want to do is make sure that this never even, that this is not happening, that these people are not preying on our communities. And the notion that it is a regional issue, and I know in previous sessions we talked about how the Northeast Corridor is very active, and we just happen to live in an area that has this regional component, so it's kind of tough. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about where are we with the process of collaboration and also just sharing data and observations that can help all of us better fill the gaps around prevention specifically? So I will tell you, um, I, I think it is a, an amazing relationship that we have, that the gang investigators have, and our executive staffs um, for district commands, particularly with Street Outreach Network. I mean, I can tell you, Luis Cardona and his staff are just amazing. Um, when we talk about real-time information, and because sometimes they're getting information we don't get. Um, and, that's, and that's an important part of this discussion um, because they share that information in a way that they protect those who provided it. And they're also making sure um, they're looking at preventive measures in order to not allow something else to happen in communities. Um, I can tell you, like, for example, we've had those incidences up in Germantown Park, for example. They have been boots on the ground from day one. Um, and I will tell you, that's had impact in that community. And I, our officers being in patrol, that we put additional officers in that community because the community was fearful that there was going to be continued retributions as a result of the shootings and the homicide that had occurred there. And I will tell you, again, street outreach was, was boots on the ground, providing us with pertinent information relevant that allowed us to be able to set up our strategies in order to be able to avert anything else happening in that community. So that's just an example. But I can tell you there are other examples that Luis has picked up the phone and called me directly um, after hearing about something that's occurred in a, in a particular community that allows me to be able to make sure we're delegating out the proper resources to address it. And so I can't, you know, I don't know of any other community that does it this way, but I can tell you that's a valuable resource for us. And, uh, and I support that wholeheartedly for us to continue that relationship. I really, uh, uh, I so much appreciate the way that you have uh, illustrated and described um, this particular effort um, because I think that not a lot of people understand um, that uh, this is the kind of data sometimes it's hard to capture because how do you capture and report when you have averted major issues? But it is so important that the you know, chief understands the value and takes advantage of that. And the community needs to know that. Um, the other question I had was regarding what seems to be an uptick in um, young women, girls going missing. Uh, and um, you know, we're already, especially in my district, there have been quite a bit of an uptick. And we're trying to figure out how to work also with parents and, and, and that type of thing. But, have, are you seeing any nexus or any issues regarding, you know, human trafficking or gang involvement, um, things like that, that we need to maybe begin to truly focus and put the spotlight on that? We have not. We've, we've been paying attention to that, um, but we have not seen this true nexus that exists that puts us in the, the mode to believe that human trafficking is occurring. 
Uh, we do see some issues, I think, with some young ladies who made decisions, and most of them bad decisions, um, to sort of connect with other folks that are involved in illegal activities. But we're not necessarily always seeing that they're going towards the gang world. But it's something that we're keeping our eye on and trying to come up with other strategies, um, and I think in order to be able to help people that are going through those types of um, issues and looking at, again, what is sort of the, um, the root cause, why are, why are our young girls doing these things, and particularly in those particular communities, why are they going missing, which, why, you know, are they doing this intentionally or is somebody coercing them in a different way? Um, and generally, we get feedback from all of our missing individuals, particularly juveniles. We're trying to figure out why are you running away or haven't come back home in X amount of days so that we get some, sub, some sense of what's going on with them that allows us to, are we dealing with a bigger trend? And I have not heard that as of yet. Thank you. And in closing, I, you know, I just want to, again, express um, my personal appreciation. I think that we here try really hard to balance things and work on the prevention side, work to listen to the community, uh, to their input, to issues that may arise that perhaps, you know, there are concerns. But I got to tell you right now, you know, the feedback that I hear time and time and time again from the most vulnerable residents here in Montgomery County is that they want to be able to trust and they feel safe to be able, you know, when they know that we have a group of law enforcement officials that are taking the time to understand these issues, collaborating with groups like, you know, the Street Outreach Network and other nonprofits. And I personally believe that that's a major asset that we have here in the county. So. There's a lot of noise, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to make sure that we have top-notch law enforcement officials that can constantly are trying to improve their own practices and work collaboratively. So just want to thank you for that. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro. Councilmember Rice had a follow-up uh, question, and then we're going to go to Councilmember Katz, followed by Councilmember Glass. Just, just very quickly, and I really want to uh, piggyback on what uh, Councilmember Navarro said and ask you. Mr. State's Attorney, because um, part of the concern in the whole don't snitch movement, all of that that goes into, because you talked about witnesses, and part of that is tied, you know, folks automatically assume that it's just about, well, I don't want to, you know, have retribution against myself, which speaks to, again, having police and community policing in the community so they can see visible and feel protected. But part of it also is this sense of that somehow that they're not going to get the resources that are necessary for them. If you're in Montgomery Village and you're testifying against a gang that has a stronghold like Hit Squad in Montgomery Village, then you're fearful of your children being assaulted, of yourself being assaulted, family, whatever the case may be. Uh, and those kinds of things are real. And so do we have the resources uh, within the state's attorney's office, and if not, it's certainly something because we're approaching budget that we can talk about, but do we have the resources necessary to either put folks up, um, hotels to provide uh, payment when it comes to uh, them not being able to go to their jobs, those kinds of things that are huge that I know other jurisdictions throughout the nation are struggling with? Uh, I think what would your, uh, Councilman Rice, I think you're actually talking about witness uh, protection or witness relocation kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you there are limited but available state funds. And do we and have we relocated individuals uh, from Montgomery County to other jurisdictions where we literally have paid for the moving of the furniture, we've helped put the security deposits down on new apartments, we've, we had, but our, our funding doesn't come out of our budget. And, and most of the funding it doesn't come out of the county budget. It, it really is. It's state monies. It's witness relocation monies. They're administered through the governor's office of crime control, through the state's attorney's association uh, st on a statewide basis. And we do tap into that on a regular basis. Uh, I am not telling you that there's sufficient monies there to help all of the people who feel that they need our assistance. I, that would not be inaccurate. Uh, but are there from time to time? I would say, look, when we're usually spending money, it's probably in our major cases. Maybe it's a homicide and somebody says, uh, you know, uh, I'm willing to testify, but I, I, you, you've got to relocate me. You've got to move me. You've got to move my, my children. And, and, and that becomes a problem, too, because there's sometimes people who 
want protection, but they also don't want to move. Right. You know, my, my children are here, they're in school. I, 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 you know, I, I want to cooperate with you, but do I have to uproot? Uh, look, I, I, it would be hard for me to say I'm going to uproot my family. Uh, and so these are personal decisions, and sometimes people make decisions after we've consulted with them that may not be what we think is in their own best interest long term in terms of their safety, but these are personal decisions they have to make for themselves. It's, it's tough. And, and, one, and, I, and I was, Councilman Abernaz, I think the biggest challenge or toughest question I ever got about a witness and intimidation issue was with one of the transnational gangs, and I think I got the phone call from you where someone was being threatened here in Montgomery County, and they said, look, you either join the gang or we'll kill your sister because we know she's an ex-village in, you know, El Salvador. And, and, I, and I, I, I think I got that call from you. And, and, and quite candidly, uh, I don't know what you do. I think we have a better chance of protecting people here locally. But when the threats are, and are they real or perceived threats? And the question is, what's the credibility of the threat? Which was one of the fundamental issues in that particular case. But if that's a real threat and they have the capacity to do it, what we were trying to do is to educate people about not using social media to put stuff out there so that people knew personal things about you. I mean, that was part of the education to everybody in the community because how did they know that this guy's this kid who was a, a teenage kid in Gaithersburg, they wanted into a gang, knew that his daughter was in a, his sister was in a particular village, put it on social media. So you, I guess they, they, they were actually, it, it was like a tip for you, how you use social media safely so that you don't expose yourself to these kinds of basically blackmail or intimidation. But that was, and I don't know we have an answer for that because we can protect you here, mm -hmm. but how do we protect you in a foreign com country where in some instances, some of those neighborhoods are not controlled right. by the government. Right. One of the things, just just to follow up on, on that one piece, uh, Mr. State's Attorney, is that what we're doing here on the council and looking at and ensuring that we don't negatively impact folks who want to join boards and commissions and understanding that by them taking the time out of their day, they're actually uh, possibly losing work, whatever the case may be, even from that standpoint. Right? I, I know how long some trials can take and what toll that can take on people who are witnesses and who need to show up and how that impacts them and their ability to be gainfully employed and to be paid, right? And so are we taking that into consideration, especially for folks who are trying to put you know, food on the table and pay the light bill? So again, and it's not something to answer here, but I think it's something that we need to think about and be cognizant about, especially when we're in the context of our uh, social justice and racial equity and, and, and looking at all of those kinds of pieces together and saying, are we doing all that we can to ensure that those are the most vulnerable are still being protected and cared for in the sense that we just assume, look, you know, you want to show up, you know, Craig Rice sees an accident that happens, you know, on Clopper Road and I show up at the courthouse, right, and testify on behalf of the state against this person who made an illegal turn. I do that because it's my civic duty, whatever the case may be. And I'm getting paid regardless of whether I come here or go to the courthouse. But the person who's got shift work, that's not the case. And so we've got to be cognizant of those things too. So thank you very much for what you're working on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Council President Katz. Thank you very much, Council. Council Member. Um, the committee Chair, I guess, is your role right this second. Mm -hmm. First off, thank you all very, very much for everything that you do, not just for this panel, but for the next panel as well. And, and I am sorry that I'm not going to be able to stay all day for, for both of the, uh, for both panels. But, you know, many years ago, and you were on it, and, I, you know, I look at all these old guys. I'm looking at John here. But, but, but yeah, you're, you're, you're very welcome, John. Very welcome. And I, and I would say that louder if you weren't here. But anyhow. Um, but years ago, we were on a task force that was Prince George's to Montgomery County that, and maybe it's been 15, 20 years, I don't know, it goes way back at this moment. But we talked about prevention, intervention, and suppression. And we said then, uh, and it was, it was pretty eye-opening. I mean, we did uh, um, community uh, participation. We went to various places in Montgomery County and in Prince George's. 
And uh, it was said then that, that uh, we can't arrest our way out of this situation, and we have not. Um, it is, it is days that it's, or years that it is better, that there's years that it's worse, and that's a, a, a something that we have to keep in mind, the fact that we had zero in 2018 for regardless of the problem, the, 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 the reason, we, we can't say, oh, we just solved that one because we're at zero. It's, it's not going to work that way. And, and, but um, I guess one of my questions is, do we have any unsolved murders in Montgomery County? Have, has, has there been arrests in every one of the, the murders that we've had in Montgomery County? No. So, um, so there have not been arrests in every murder. And, and obviously, I know that, that you, you work on it to, to do that, but uh, to, to, uh, to, to bring justice and, 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 uh, and peace to the, to the families that are associated with this. Um, but the nonprofit community is a very, very important part of, of all of our work. And, and I want to publicly thank them. And, and, and to, uh, to Gabe's point, I, I know of, of, of reasons. I mean, I've had phone calls as well. Of, <laughs> Of someone that was in, in, in uh, received phone calls from people in the nonprofit community that said that someone was in imminent danger, and what could we do? And this was when I was back, you know, as the mayor of Gaithersburg, and we all worked together to solve it. And I know that keeps going on. We have to keep in mind that in many cases, the gangs have become a new family unit for a, a group, uh, for especially our young people. They they uh, feel comfortable with with or and 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 have get to uh, council member rice's point they receive money they they feel important because they're a part of this of this new family unit and of course they're really not safe but they want to believe that they're that they're safer because of it um i think it has to be noted that that um our community this council needs to continue to work together as one group and that's for the nonprofit community for the panel that's going to speak after this one for everything to get our young people out of a situation especially our young people out of a situation that they've gotten themselves into candidly in many cases without thinking and now don't know what to do to get out of there and we have to help them figure that out i remember years ago that that there was a we had a program or there was a program somewhere that to remove tattoos so that somebody could get out of out of the you know the, the markings, and in some cases, some people were removing the tattoos so they could join another group, another gang, and of course that certainly didn't that wasn't our idea to do that. So we I, I know that that people are afraid. I remember years ago that there was an incident in in Gaithersburg where a gang member firebombed a an apartment unit because the mother would not allow the daughter to date some this young man who was who threw the bomb and of course he was caught and and we worked together with with everyone to, to get it together but this has been going on for years this isn't just this just now and we the uh we need to keep each other informed and we need to to make certain that that um that each of us remain safe for, our, for ourselves and for our neighbors and, and, I, and I know that, that the chief mentioned Luis and, and Raymond and, and, and many other people that, that really do help us and, and to get people to a better situation. And it's not, and I, we shouldn't speak of this just in economic terms because this is much deeper than that, but just on economic terms. If we lock up someone and, and it, if, you, if the figure $35,000 a year is, is the right figure for the, to incarcerate somebody, that means that, we're, that we can incarcerate for each million dollars, it's around 28, 29 people. Well, if we spend the money up front, and that's just the cost to that person, it's not talking about the cost to, to the families and everybody else. If we spend the money up front for the Luises and, the, and everybody else is associated with this, we, just from an economic standpoint, and it's not just economics, but just from an economic standpoint, we've made a very wise investment in Montgomery County. And we need to continue, to, and we do this, but we need to continue to keep this in mind when we go through budgets, that it's important to spend money up front so that these young people, especially, and, and for education as well, I mean, education is a huge part of it, as, as Craig pointed out, 
so that the our, our young people realize there is a better path forward for them and for everybody else. And, and I think we're going to continue to do that. We obviously need to make certain that our police officers, to, to, to Nancy's point, that our police officers understand how to get someone uh, to, to, make, to keep our, 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 our uh, community safe, that we need to have the intelligence, we need to do everything that is necessary. But if we don't continue a unified front, we're not going to, we're not going to ever get ourselves at it. And this community, our community, is extremely safe compared to many other communities. I had someone just yesterday ask me if there's gangs in Montgomery County. And I said, yes, there are. But the fact that this person didn't know it shows that, first of all, is one good sign, I mean, that they didn't know it. But we need to make certain that we continue to do what we're doing and probably redouble our efforts. Thanks. Those are excellent comments. I want to do a quick time check. We have another joint committee session after this on school bus safety, and we want to make sure that we get to as many comments as possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Glass, and then we will hear from Chief McSwain and Director Talley, and then we will go on to our prevention and intervention panel. So Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll try to be brief, as I always try to. Um, thank you all for, for the work that you do for providing this deep dive. Um, I associate myself with many of the questions my colleagues have asked. I particularly appreciate the, the questions that Councilmember Navarro asked, especially regarding uh, the incidents uh, that we've been reading about in the region regarding young women, um, and appreciate the clarification that, that you've provided on those. Um, uh, Mr. McCarthy, I also appreciate uh, your comments regarding protecting all of our residents and the charge you have directed your staff to uphold, making sure that everyone feels safe to cooperate, making sure that everyone feels safe to participate, and ultimately making sure that everyone feels safe to live here. So thank you for that. Um, the, the, the question I have is part question but part reiteration of something that you have said. In 2017, there have been 31 cases of violent crimes and zero convictions. In 2018, there were 64 cases of violent crimes. This is based on the, yep, 64 cases of violent crimes and three gang participation convictions. And in 2019, there were three, 113 cases of violent crimes and 11 convictions of gang participation. Um, for the people who are monitoring this conversation, I just want to make it clear that those increases in numbers is due in part, large part, because of the $850,000 of investment for you all to do that work. It is not because of any other circumstances or necessarily uh, some spike if you were to do the numbers in, in violent crime here in Montgomery County. Is that correct? I, I actually think that's a wonderful question. I, I appreciate your asking that question. I heard someone was calling you about a quote that was made on Fox television about the explosion of gang crime in Montgomery County last week. These numbers are merely a reflection. It is a reflection of the investment. It is a re reflection of us investing new bodies into it. This is not, should not be interpreted to suggest that these numbers show uh, an explosion of gang-related crime. And if someone tries to misuse those numbers, I would caution them not to do so. And that's why I really appreciate that question. And it was reported last week on the news, and we were trying to figure out where, where that came from, because I don't think the facts support the allegation that are heard on Fox News. If, if I were to look at this PowerPoint in a, in a vacuum, you could easily extrapolate I appreciate that. And that's why I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent point, Councilmember Glass. Um, really appreciate your reinforcing that. So a disproportionate number of homicide victims and the perpetration of homicides have occurred in our local park system. So Chief McSwain, could you talk about any updates from your perspective on what you're seeing transpiring or just general updates? Sure, thank you. And good morning to everybody. Chief Daryl McSwain, Park Police. And I uh, certainly want to thank the council for your commitment to this important endeavor. As uh, you all have mentioned, this has been going on for a good 15, 20 years. But uh, just importantly, you all have been at the forefront of uh, just the same. So I thank you. And obviously, it's always an honor to be up here with my uh, colleagues from the other agencies. And we certainly work very well together. 
Also with me uh, today is uh, Parks Director uh, Mike Riley, as well as uh, a couple of my other colleagues in the office, uh, Captain Mike Murphy. He um, not only oversees the investigation section, but also serves on the Safe Street, the FBI Safe Street Task Force, uh, which deals with regional gang issues. Uh, Captain Jeff Coe over patrol and Lieutenant Coles, uh, Deputy uh, Commander of the Investigative Section. Very similar to uh, what my colleagues have uh, shared, we have seen a difference between 17 all the way through, of course, where we are at this particular point. Back in 17, we had two homicides, a few uh, first degree assaults, as many as five robberies, and of course, graffiti. I'm very pleased to say that uh, today, over the last two years, our biggest gang-related crimes have been graffiti-related. Um, we don't necessarily take it uh, lightly because we understand graffiti is still very important to the gang culture, if you will, to basically mark territory, but fortunately we're actually measuring those numbers in the teens as opposed to counting homicides or rapes and robberies and those types of things. Very similar to what uh, Lieutenant Rosario mentioned earlier, the numbers that I report are, of course, gang-related that we can verify, but our biggest concern, of course, is what uh, are gang-affiliated and or those that we don't necessarily know uh, are uh, perpetrated by certain gang members. We are literally weeks away from um, taking on a new crime mapping software, which will help us to be able to track more, um, I guess, more poignantly those things that may be related and or affiliated, but where that becomes very important is because we share information together. And what we're finding is for those members that we do come across within the park system itself, because they use the park system not only for meetings, but also, of course, to traverse the parks from one place to the next. We do find that on occasion, um, some of the same names that we come across are same names that they're dealing with also in different investigations. So we do uh, make it a point to talk with each other. Uh, very similar also, what we have found is Two of the biggest challenges that we have, gang intimidation, as far as people coming forward, and also the fear of being deported by certain community members as well, as far as what they will do. And I'll share a few things that we're doing to hopefully um, alleviate some of that. We have taken a three-pronged approach um, within the park system, prevention, intervention, and education. Under the prevention model, one of the things we want to do is simply prevent it by being present. Uh, we have, very similar to the county itself, we have found that there are certain pockets where we find probably more of a prevalence of gang presence, if you will. Silver Spring, of course, being one, a little bit uh, in Wheaton and also in uh, Gaithersburg as well. So the trail system that go through the Long Branch of Matthew Henson, uh, Sligo Creek, Northwest, et cetera, we have made those priorities um, as far as um, patrolling. We uh, went from last year roughly about 570 trail checks of those our respective locations to nearly 2,000 this year um, for a 200% increase. And that's been purposely done. Obviously, we figure if we're present, then hopefully prevent someone becoming the victim. But just importantly, what we have uh, really emphasized is people getting out of their vehicles, meaning the officers, we're getting the horses down there that much more often, uh, ATV, foot and bike. We also uh, purchased some electric bikes as well, so we can go even that much further and that much quicker. Reason being, we want the average citizen to feel comfortable <laughs> to just walk up to the officer and just chat, develop those reports. But also what we find is for people who will not feel comfortable calling 911, they will share, hey, in this section over here, they're harassing the females. Can you all come down here more often? Or can you clear out this brush right here? such as we found at the Long Branch uh, uh, Bridge, if you're all familiar with that, yeah. clearing out that brush with the uh, maintenance section and places like that and doing those little things that make a big difference. But of course, also, we still come across some gang members as well. And hopefully what we're sending a message is that, hey, we're here and we're not going anywhere. We want to work with you. Very similar to what you mentioned, Mr. Katz. If you want to get out of a gang, we certainly want to be here to help you put you in the right uh, place with the appropriate resources, but certainly we don't want other people to be victimized. I'll give you one quick example. For those may be familiar with the Valley Mill Park um, location. Park officer was um, driving home, actually saw a group of uh, young men about six o'clock in the morning um, at the park itself, but he, he could tell that they weren't necessarily um, 
members of the home that was relatively close by. So he went over there to stop them because he figured, hey, it's 6 o'clock in the morning, they're not having a Boy Scout meeting. He does so, and it turns out to be they were, in fact, uh, members of a transnational gang. Two of the members had property on them from a Washington, D.C. robbery. Washington, D.C. literally uh, came up that same morning. But before the investigation was completed, uh, we found a handgun, two pellet guns, and a knife. We never know what may have been prevented that morning, but we're grateful that it did, in fact, happen. And hopefully they can uh, get the help that they need. So other parts of our prevention, I'll go through these really quickly out of respect for time, is uh, mandating more participation of our recreation centers. We do have a good partnership with the recreation centers. We call it adopt a center, if you will. We're expecting every patrol officer to have a few within their respective beats. Nice. That they not only get out of their cars, but they get to know people in the uh, facility itself, and we're tracking those on a regular basis. And as my colleagues know, but for the public, the parks, Park police have jurisdiction over 85% of Montgomery County Recreation Centers, not MCPD. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll give you a hug later, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Work with maintenance staff again. If we see graffiti, the goal is to remove it as quickly as possible because you know that that can also lead to other issues, especially if a rival gang says, nope, we're moving into this location, so forth and so on. But it also helps with the ambiance, not to mention the perception of a community when it's clean. Uh, we've actually increased our plain clothes special assignment team. We have found that they've been a very, very good uh, return on investment, not only being in a location before something occurs, but also helping us to quickly solve cases, whether it be graffiti related and or assault related. We do share intelligence with our local partners, also to include those who are relatively close to us in other jurisdictions. Periodically, we will get a call to say, hey, we're getting intelligence that this gang is going to be at this park to assault this gang. Well, if we get that information, we'll actually literally place officers there, uh, again, in the, um, the hopes of uh, preventing certain things. And then uh, whether it be Luis uh, Cardona, I think it's probably wasn't uh, more than two weeks since I was in my uh, post about two years ago. Uh, he and I have always had a good relationship. He gives me a call and say, hey, I need you at this vigil. There may be some retaliation. So those type of discussions continue to go on, not to mention uh, as well as with MCP and many, many others. As far as intervention, what we're seeking to do is establish an anonymous tip line also. Again, we realize certain community members are not going to come forward, but we want them to feel like they can still get a voice up to some place uh, relatively quickly. About a year ago, we assigned a member to the MCP, Gang Task Force. I felt it was important to keep that conduit of information open between the parks and MCP, and vice versa, and it's my understanding from feedback that has been working out very well. To be in uh, two places at one time, we realize everybody has a limited staff. Everybody's doing the best that they can. But we're now starting to invest more in technology to include camera <coughs> systems, both fixed camera systems and mobile camera systems. So that if we start seeing a spike or something in a certain type of offense, the mobile camera helps us to get deep into certain trails whereby we can actually find out who's responsible, close the case, stop the trend, obviously prevent uh, more victims from uh, occurring. But just important, at places where we know we've traditionally had some challenges, Long Branch, Wheaton, we've uh, recently um, put up some fixed cameras, which helps us with the artificial intelligence. We can literally set certain information in there whereby it can tell us, hey, at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's not an animal, that's a person. Mm. And the question then becomes, why is that a person there at 2 o'clock in the morning? So we can literally bring it up on the communi com communication section uh, um, uh, uh, office, and they can alert, of course, the park officer to go by, hopefully again, to uh, prevent an issue from occurring. Efficient use of resources. And then also we're seeking to put more literature in various languages. We understand that not everybody speaks uh, English fluently. So we're hoping to put some of the resource information in different languages so people, again, feel relatively comfortable. And as far as the education piece, and I'll wrap up here, uh, we are, in fact, using um, social media that much more often, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, uh, it being a, I was just a, a way that people communicate at this point. 
but more so to get information out there regarding resources. Um, I have been on Spanish radio on multiple occasions, will continue to do so, because I understand the fear. And what we're ultimately trying to share with them is that nobody has to suffer in silence, uh, if possible. Uh, we're also uh, seeking to increase our own diversity within our agency itself. We've been able to receive a uh, grant from the um, state itself but more so for specialty skills, i.e. speaking a second language. And when we get these officers, the goal is to place them in places where that language can be used on a regular basis and people feel comfortable. And then the last thing I'll mention is the School Resource Officer Program. Ed Clark and I go a long way back, uh, probably about a year, year and a half ago here. Can you say which program was that again? School Resource Officer. Okay. <laughs> so Ed Clark and I go a long way back. He reached out to me about a year ago. I've always been a proponent of it, of course. Um, certainly know the uh, value of that program, uh, both which you can measure and that which, of course, you can't measure. That still makes a big, big difference. But our goal, if we're able to get a grant uh, for the school resource officer program, is not only put an officer in a school, but our focus will be the middle school level. Uh, in the middle school level and locations where there's a concern, not only is, does gang recruiting start at the middle school level, but more importantly, we want to develop that rapport with the youth at a very, very early stage before, of course, um, their life makes a, uh, a tragic Chief change. McSwain, you've, you've touched on so many important points. Um, I do want to follow up that right now in the future regarding the graffiti issue. Um, anecdotally, we are starting to see, particularly on state highways and state overpasses, um, and so this crosses over a T&E &E issue um, that, that we're going to want to take a close look at. Um, I need to do a time check. We've got about uh, 20 minutes or so left, and we obviously have another uh, very important discussion after this. And so, Director Talley, you have huge friends and fans, uh, and we could all listen to you all day. Um, what I'd like to propose, because we will continue these updates moving forward, that we begin with corrections next time. But if you could briefly give us some highlights um, that would be relevant and as necessary, we will follow up. And I will also state, we will obviously have the next panel to discuss prevention and intervention. That could be its own hour and a half. And so as necessary, we will need to schedule a follow up to make sure that it gets the attention uh, and the light that it deserves so that we're not rushed. Um, but Director Talley, if you could give some highlights and then we will turn to the next panel acknowledging that we may have to have a follow-up to this discussion. All right, so thank you um, for the opportunity to uh, represent uh, DOCR and present this information to you today. Um, joined by Warden Malagari and our two specialized gang officers. Um, and to keep it very brief, um, you can imagine there are significant challenges to, to care and uh, manage the custody of gang members in a confined setting. Um, we have to have sound policy and practice in place um, to be, prevent opportunities for violence, retaliation, recruitment, gang activity. Um, and it starts with our two specialized gang officers that we added um, uh, to our complement. We added the second officer in, in 2011. Um, in 2010, just to share some numbers, we have 47 validated gang members. That number since 2011 and to present has been 150 plus. And I agree with the state's attorney, um, McCarthy, that the more you validate, the more you will validate. And with the use of social media, those numbers have increased. Nonetheless, we still have to deal with it in, in restrictive settings and be able to, to effectively manage it and keep everyone safe um, and also provide services for people before they get released. Because we hope people will be released better than when, um, in the state than what we receive them. Um, we had three major incidents with uh, multiple gang members that occurred in 2019. Um, and we have minor incidents all the time um, where uh, gang members are trying to either get to rival gang members um, and be very uh, strategic in their ways of being able to um, get to these rival gangs. And so we have a lot of uh, housing classification decisions that we are making all the time that's <coughs> going to prevent opportunities for that to happen. Um, reducing the amount of people who are outside of a given cell at any given time, um, using our protective custody and um, segregation um, when we need to, to be able to protect people. Um, we have 188 validated gang members across all the population of DOCR, and that, and that includes pretrial supervision. But inside, we have 143, which is about 20 percent, um, significant numbers, um, 66 from different, um, 66 different gangs inside. Um, these are Montgomery County, National, Prince George's District of, of Columbia. 
And we have to work quickly. We have to act swiftly to address uh, and respond um, to any kind of incidents or activities that occur in the jail. And our gang officers do an exceptional job. Um, some of the challenges that we're seeing local gangs, um, individuals who may receive state time in a local gang come back in there in the national gang. Um, different mentality, different set of circumstances to deal with. Um, and so these are things that, that we deal with. Um, language barriers, we're looking at maybe investigating whether we would have the resources somewhere to be able to add a bilingual um, officer to our complement. The two do a wonderful job, but there are multiple things that they're doing as they're coordinating with the police department, be able to, to investigate incidents, be able to in, interview um, individuals, because people are, sometimes are, are more often now hiding the fact that they are in gangs um, and because of the additional charges for the graffiti um, and, and other um, things that may, that you can easily say that you are responsible for. And so we are, are still getting some that are self-validating for protective reasons. I'm, I'm this and I don't want to be over here. Um, but there is still a significant amount of work that our two officers have to do on a daily basis to keep our facility safe and to be able to work with our programs and services the, um, section to be able to, uh, because they're involved. If people are going to go on the program, it's a collaborative joint decision looking at a person's um, history and whether they can, we have to put a limit on how many people can be in one program at, at one time. It is sad to say that, but for the safety and to avoid gang fights and um, um, attacks, we have to be able to do that. Um, so, and the other information is in your packet, so I do want to quickly kind of respond because a lot of your questions, some of the council members have been about what we're doing um, on the, the, to help people to provide opportunities for education and services. And so what you report to us, and we work with a lot of the agencies that's already been mentioned, what re you report to us is that um, their involvement and um, gang activity and crime is needs not being met at home, um, not feeling loved or accepted, going to be going to bed hungry, homelessness, lack of income, neighborhood affiliations, which <coughs> is huge, um, that contribute. Um, they report they're being recruited to schools, libraries, recreation centers, places that you believe are safe. Um, but when we're trying to recruit others, methods are becoming more, you know, more savvy. Um, and what doesn't look like something, it is something. And so um, this is what is reported to us. These aren't our statements. And so we have a robust youth, youthful offender program for um, uh, 21 and, um, age group and under that's going to help start looking, help youth start identifying some of the decision makers and environmental factors that contribute um, to some of their behaviors. Um, the more we can get people involved in pro-social activities like education, inside jobs, inside, uh, we believe that it will help a person be able to think, you know, I have choices. I have a new direction. Um, when we talk about the income, we do trans transition individuals from detention services to the pre-release and re-entry um, services program when they're able to get there. So there's opportunities to be able to get closer to home, be able to have home visits, be able to look for employment outside in the community. We will still track that person if they are a validated gang member, if they are approved to go, because we don't, we've had incidents where people take the gang activity from one facility down into the community. And so we want to be able to still remind people that they're still going to be accountable for whatever decisions and activities you make at different programs. Uh, we collaborate with the Health and Human Services Street Outreach Pro um, Network, which comes into the jail once a month to perform groups. And I think that's a, a, a vital community connection for people before they are released. Um, they can probably get information from individuals that we can't, um, quite frankly, um, because of the credibility of that program and um, the people who are running that program. Um, imagination stage is something we entered into in 2019. Very proud to say that um, where we're going to have a presentation, our first one on February, and I know Lewis is probably going to, Cardona is probably going to um, talk about it as well, where they're going to put on a performance, the Youth Offenders Program. And so um, we're, any opportunity to be able to give people new experiences, um, new uh, exposure to arts, to any kind of creativity, we're going to be able to be open to that. Um, we're, Thank you. That yeah. that is That's unbelievable. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. I want to I want to come back to this and sure. follow up. I know that <laughs> Council Member Navarro has a question sure. um, that I want to make sure we get to. No. Sure. Okay. Nope. Sorry. Or, oh, Council Member Hucker. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, thanks. Yeah, before we, thank you, Mr. Chairman, just before we move to the next panel, I want to echo the comments of my colleagues um, about how much we appreciate all your, your hard work on this. Um, Chief McSwain, uh, you mentioned the um, the nexus between trails and and uh, and crime and gang activity, and periodically we hear from neighborhoods where there's a new trail proposed, like some of the new trails that are getting built in the Ridgeline Trails in the Crest Haven neighborhood. Um, some concern from neighbors that <clears throat> if you put a trail in, this is going to bring crime to the neighborhood. Um, should they be worried about that? I don't believe so. I think the opposite effect can actually occur. <laughs> the more people. Uh, that are on a uh, in this particular location, i.e., just simply going about regular business, actually deters crime. Um, gang members pr prey on locations whereby there's seclusion, if you will, uh, and the ability to basically, um, you know, victimize people without all the witnesses available. So the more likely something is used, or the more prevalent a location is occupied by everyday citizens, if you will, um, the chance of uh, crime actually goes down. That's good to hear you say that. That's been my assumption. I think uh -huh. the criminals want to be in the woods. They're going to be in the woods anyway, with or with or without a trail. And of course, those things should be accompanied with things such as lighting, you know, yep. with other um, septet type of um, um, amenities. Right. Well. But just like a street, the right. more people in an area, yeah. often less crime you're going to have. And Director Talley, thanks for your work. Could you uh, touched on this, but could you elaborate a little bit on what services are available um, uh, for formerly? Um, for former gang members and previously incarcerated gang members, either um, through the pre-release center or outside the pre-release center, for you mentioned job placement and other services. Yes. Well, um, pre-release center is, is um, a phase you can <coughs> transition to if you're already sentenced. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, the center, the program accepts those who are within one year of, of release, and so we can transfer you um, with a year. Sometimes, most is about six months that you're transferred down from our Clarksburg facility if you qualify for and you're eligible, you're not receiving write-ups at detention serve up at the uh, Clarksburg facility. And so they're afforded the opportunity that everyone is on the program to be able to, you, if you're um, under the age of a certain age and you haven't received your high school diploma or GED, you're mandated to go to classes because we believe that's important. Um, but you have the opportunity to seek outside employment outside of the facility. We have three dedicated work release coordinators who help individuals with resumes, being able to interview properly, skill identification, um, whether and, and if there's a training program that's more suited because everyone isn't ready to work. Um, if a person is a high school graduate, we explore college opportunities with them and, and individuals are uh, permitted to be able to go to, 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 um, to attend college and maybe work part time. And so there's a host of opportunities available and, as, and assistance available for people as they transition out. I would like to see the majority of those who are leaving our um, facilities be able to transition into that because that's when you start with the family unification. You have sponsors who are coming in who are part of your reentry plan, part of the things that you're setting as goals that you want to achieve before you re leave the center and even after and beyond. Yeah, the really connection helpful. to workforce development is very important uh, in this space, which is an ongoing conversation we're having as well. One, yes. One, one just quick final. Since there's nobody here from MCPS and you mentioned the SROs, can any of you comment on um, any training you provide to MCPS staff, SROs and outside and beyond SROs, as far as identifying gang activity um, in the schools? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So um, we provide um, at least annual training to all of our S SROs um, to identify um, or, or at least recognize some of the um, indicators of a person being either involved in a gang or being recruited, um, and that's a generous term as, uh, as we know. Yeah. Um, we also sort of do a kind of train the trainer thing where we encourage them to share that training with uh, school security staff and teachers and as many people as they can within the school system. Well, that's and what I was going to ask. Does it just stay at the SRO level or is it penetrating to teachers and uh, counselors, particularly at the middle school level too? Yeah, we actually, um, you know, the, the, the gang unit itself also participates in training. We just did one with, um, with Ed Clark of uh, M MCPS uh, maybe two weeks ago where we put on um, an entire presentation on the same sort of information and there was nothing but school staff there. So um, every opportunity we get to collaborate with them and share this information, we do. How often do those happen? Um, I would say every few months, but I think they're going um, to they're, they're increase. Okay. Great. Thank you very much.
Thank you all. We are going to hear from uh, the next panel uh, to sort of frame the conversation, but there will be a more definitive follow-up to dive deeper. But if we could bring representatives from Health and Human Services, um, Recreation, Identity, uh, the Latin American Youth Center, that would be great. <laughs> I know. So I'd like to begin by uh, uh, Dr. Crowell and then my colleague and friend, Luis Cardona. Um, if, well, first, if everybody could introduce themselves, um, and then we will have HHS begin uh, with a quick overview. And as I said, there will be a follow-up session to this where we will dive deeper. And I can't, we all owe you guys a cup of coffee uh, for, for coming this morning. But if you could each introduce yourselves, and then we will start with HHS. Luis. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Luis Cardona, for the record, administrator for the HHS Positive Youth Development Program. Raymond Kroll, uh, director of the Department of Health and Human Services. Jacob Newman, managing director for Montgomery County with Latin American Youth Center, and I have my colleague, our president and CEO, Lupe Grady, behind me. Yay. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Miranda Williams, youth development manager with Montgomery County Recreation. Catherine Smithson, Case Manager Coordinator at Identity's Crossroads Youth Opportunity Center. Good morning. My name is Fresia Guzman. I'm the Director of the Youth Opportunity Center at Identity. Wonderful. Uh, why don't we start with an overview on where things stand with Dr. Crowell, followed by Luis. Okay. I'm going to be, um, one of the nice things about this, I've shortened my remarks because a lot of things have been said already, so I don't have to go over and, and repeat a lot of things. It is a point of pride for me, just as an aside, that, that every one of those presentations that you heard said Luis Cardona and HHS and so it was really it speaks volumes so either Luis Cardona is an incredible team of one or has an incredible staff of 200 people that is spread all over this county doing all kinds of interesting things um, sadly he does not have a team of 200 um, but but they do a lot with what they have and and it's a it's a point of pride what you heard around this issue of gang violence and, and, and positive youth development. Uh, I think that is, is, is integral to the success. It's, it's the colleagues that you saw across the table, um, recreation, police, MCPS, libraries, um, identity, LAYC, faith communities as well, this, that is working um, to try to address this issue and the, the, the precursors to this issue in some cases of gang violence and gang involvement to, to, in some cases. Um, result of the collaboration is that we haven't experienced the level of, of youth and gang violence that is impacting other jurisdictions. Um, we, we are fortunate in that, that this collaboration has been effective and is working, uh, but that does not mean that we are not at risk and at continuous risk of increases in the numbers of folks, increases in the numbers of recruited uh, who are, who are um, either in gangs or at risk or, or, or affiliated with gangs or at risk of being pulled into gangs or vulnerable to, to, to the behavior and, and, and actions of, of gangs. That is particularly significant in the black and brown communities in, in, in the county. Um, there, is, there is an incredible amount of work that we have been doing, um, the Street Outreach Network and, and, and PYD, uh, focused on uh, uh, trying to help. You've heard about the correction, the work we're doing in the correctional facility. Uh, we are seeing an increase of, of, of young girls who are at increased risk of becoming prime uh, recruitment targets for local gangs and potentially victims of those gangs as well. Um, I think the, the, the um, um, two-gen poverty is an issue for us and working with, with, with two, on addressing two-gen poverty as a way of diverting and preventing work is another area that, that uh, our department and, and the Street Outreach Network and PYD has gotten themselves engaged in. This is a, the work of this group is a time and intensive and relationship intensive effort. Uh, the Street Outreach Network is, is doing an incredible amount of work uh, across all of those things that you've heard about uh, this morning. Um, 
and in the communities that, that are facing challenges beyond, um, beyond gang violence. So the work that Street Outreach Network has done has expanded beyond just gang violence to trying to do more work in communities to, to engage them in it and help to empower them and help them to find alternatives. Um, I am I am I'm both um, um, Council Member Navarro, you made a comment about uh, about averting a problem and, and how do you assess that? And I think that is possible to do some work to talk about how do we uh, identify folks who are gang involved and help them to step back and begin to track that and, and look at what happens once we get someone who's engaged in this in, in, with us and engaged with street outreach network. Um, I think, more importantly, positive youth development is, is not about just averting. It is about the promotion of, of skills and opportunities and, and alternatives, um, educational opportunities and jobs and relationship opportunities that is, that is important. I talked to uh, my staff about this as, as, a, as a, if you think about your GPS system, you don't just program avoidances and you don't start by programming avoidances, you start by programming your destination and positive youth development is at its heart about the destination of our kids and, and the development, the healthy development of our children. Avoidances are the things that we program in after we know where we're going. So we've always got to keep in mind where our long-term goal is as we do this prevention work and this, and this gang intervention work. Um, we are, to that end, uh, Joanne Barnes will not be joining us this morning just to save us a little bit of time, but one of the things that we want to do in coming back to you is talk about what we are characterizing as a positive youth development initiative that is for us a chance of, of um, strengthening our collaborative efforts and becoming more deliberate about the things that we're doing in our partnerships. Um, uh, thinking about regional efforts, thinking about how we are organized and structured to do this work, um, how we plan and promote best practices for where we intervene and what we do uh, with, with, with the communities, and then looking at grants and joint funding opportunities to, to, to grow what we do in a, in a more effective way. Um, I, I said I was proud of, of, of the work. I'm also concerned about it. Uh, I think that the level of, uh, of uh, effort of, of uh, Street Outreach Network and, and the work of Luis and his team um, far and away exceeds the boundaries and the initial mission scope of, of, of the work. Um, and that is, is clearly necessary and clearly something that, that, that we have engaged in. My team goes into places um, that, are, that put them at risk and they engage people in communities that are at risk themselves, whether they're uh, exposed to gangs or threatened by gangs or have some cross-gang involvement in some cases that makes this, 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 this a, a balancing act between promoting trust and safety, um, both for the folks that we engage with and for the, for the, for the staff themselves. Um, their job is pulling people out of risk and out of harm's way, and that has that carries a lot of challenges and, and, and balancing acts. And, and the team has done a remarkable job. Um, I worry about them uh, both in terms of their level of stress and their capacity, and the the real potential of being spread so thinly that we don't have enough impact in a community or in a neighborhood to make a, a, a lasting and gradual change. Because this change takes time. Um, I think. Um, I'm going to turn this over to, to, to Luis Cardona to give you a deeper look at, at what happens with PYD and Street Outreach Network and the things that we are working on. So I'll, I'll stop there and say thank you for the opportunity and look forward to coming back. That sounds great. Dr. Crowell, you framed perfectly our next discussion because I think it actually is appropriate to discuss prevention <coughs> intervention, not just within the context of gangs, but a much broader and the, the concerns that you raised are very real and raw that also extend to our nonprofit providers and partners uh, who are also on the front lines. Um, Council Member Navarro has a, a question, thought, or comment, uh, and then Luis, you're going to get the final word in just a couple minutes or less, and as I said, we will be following up on this discussion um, in, in as, as quickly as possible, as soon as we can get it on the calendar. But I, I do want to say that I, I do want to be remiss in not acknowledging that that stress and that anxiety and those, those challenges apply not only to the street outreach network, but to the colleagues and staff that are... Absolutely. Staff. I know you know that. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. Know that they know that. Yes. I want to acknowledge yes. that with them. Council Member Navarro. <clears throat> So um, I guess that, you know, after, of course, um, reflecting on all the years that we've been working together um, and thinking about so many things that sometimes do frustrate me um, because it, it feels sometimes as if not a lot has changed. Let me just say that this morning I do um, have a, I would say, a, you know, newfound um, sense of optimism because what I have heard the leadership of the of the police department of the park police and now you, in terms of how you're referring to this positive youth development and this work that Luis has been heading for many many years in partnership with 
incredible uh, nonprofit organizations like Identity and the Latin American Youth yeah. Center, um, which quietly, some of us have been, you know, toiling uh, behind the scenes, really working so hard. Many of the people sitting on this dais, you know, putting more money uh, every single year in a reconciliation list, recognizing, but clearly for me, to be honest, a uh, sense of anxiety, because what you just described is absolutely true. Mm what this team in collaboration, ha what they've been doing out in the community has, has not been recognized or acknowledged the way it should be. Mm. The things that they see on a daily basis and the things that they handle on a daily basis is extraordinary and it's a model. And so now that here we are, you know, sort of in the dawn of new era of leadership, when I also look at, for example, demographics of the school system, right, which is, you know, 53.8% brown and black, then we really need to shift the conversation about resources. We, we, we need to stop acting as if we're trying to gather as many crumbs as possible, you know, to invest in our positive youth development because these are not crumb numbers, right? This is now what we know, a very large part of not only our school system, but our county. So the resources need to be treated that way. And as we begin conversations about our operating budget, let us not continue to do what we've had to do all these years, which has been to just you know, work so hard to add a little bit more capacity and a little bit more capacity. Let us really prioritize funding in order to serve our youth, not pockets as we have been treating it in the past, but our youth because the numbers now reflect <laughs> that urgency and that level of approach. So I just wanted to really put that out because that will be how I'm gonna you know, be looking at all of this. Um, let us also share, and I'm looking forward to the next session, let us share the strategies and everything that this collaboration has yielded because it is a national model uh, for sure. At very small <laughs> you know, resources um, that I hope again, starting this year, we will not have to scramble at the end, but that hopefully the executive who was sitting here and we had these conversations many times, so that's why I'm hopeful, um, will include sufficient funding to provide the capacity for all of these folks. And, uh, and to all of you, thank you for hanging in there, especially Luis Cardona. Uh, thank you for hanging in there all these years, because I know it's rough and I know it takes a personal toll on the staff as well as them as leaders. Um, every single day, but they've done this with courage and they've done it with a lot of strength and professionalism. So just really thank you very much. That was so perfectly said, nailed it. Um, Luis, you're gonna get the final word this morning. And then as I said, we will schedule a follow-up session. I would also like to propose as discussed in previous work sessions, particularly with regards to intervention on the gang issue uh, intervention, um, our faith-based partners are also a key player um, in this and I know um, Councilmember Navarro has been a real leader uh, in trying to make sure that they are engaged in this discussion. So as we focus on prevention and intervention, I'd like to invite some of those partner organizations as well. Luis, final word. Yes, good morning. I apologize for the coat. I'm just recovering being very sick, so I apologize for that. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things just to, to clarify. Uh, the intent of our program is never to put any of our staff in harm's way and so we're very intentional and thank you to all of you on the council for the support as well as the uh, executive to make sure there's adequate funding to train and retrain and recertify our staff so that we have very uh, strong standard operating procedures for how we do this work to continue to maintain the same level of professionalism but at the same time take in consideration the risks that come with th this type of work so i just wanted to add that then a couple of things because I do believe we, the county, has done a significant amount to invest, thanks to your leadership again. And what one of the things that we're kind of moving on now is to figure out how we help work in partnership with the community, having the community take a little more um, ownership in owning this piece, where they're guiding us and like, really, this is what we need you to do in our communities to address these issues. So again, thankful for the funding for the uh, a safe space program because that is the avenue or the mechanism we have used to fund the community sentinel training that we're doing and we'll be doing again in March, uh, bringing in uh, residents from the community, training them in how to access counter resources, 
but also how to work in conjunction and have a certain level of ownership. So this is a, a community-owned effort. And then just the last piece I was going to mention, going back, because I know it was brought up around the social media piece, uh, in our work in, in particular with the youthful offenders of the Cockroach Jail, you know, we had these constant conversations with many of these young men who chose to use social media to advertise the crimes they committed. And so what we decided to do is to redirect those efforts and just say, look, why don't you use that in a positive manner? And so we're really thankful for our partnership with Imagination Stage on this new pilot program that really uses an art space, cultural-based approach to help create spaces for healing. And that's really the, the foundation of what we try to do is you know, lift up culture, lift up those healing-informed spaces for these young people to work through these issues. But we also recognize that there's a huge need for family support, especially for supports for, uh, for young girls and, and whatnot. And we continue to work forward with our community partners. We're very excited of the program that we've been doing with the Family Strengthening Peace through Catholic Charities and believe that is a, another huge asset that can help us both with young people as well as families. But we know that it's not going to take one month or a year. It's going to take a, a lifelong journey on, realistically for some of these young people and some of these families and some of these communities to heal. But we continue being intentional of our efforts to make sure community voice guides what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. I just want to say to LAYC and Identity, um, I'm intimately familiar with both of your operations and the Recreation Department as well. And so we look forward to hearing more from, well, all of your incredible work at the next session, which we'll schedule as soon as possible. So Councilmember Rice, your light just came on. Just just as very quickly, and I really want to thank LAYC and Montgomery County Recreation and Identity because uh, the concept of, and Luis, you already know how I feel about you, so I don't need to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, the reach one, teach one uh, proverb is existing in exactly what it is that you do because re-educating our kids and making sure that they understand how they're valued, which they might not get mm. from their individual communities where they're surrounded, and making sure that they understand that people are loved is the counteractive to the gang mechanism that says that the only people that are going to love you are us. Mm. And by you redefining that and making sure that folks understand, whether it's working through creative programs like Conservation Corps, or whether it's Fashion Boot Camp that tells people about something that they've never ever seen before, and I can be involved and engaged in this and have a great time, and whether it's bringing kids together through sports and other kinds of activities and empowering them for jobs. These are all things that show that we care about them. Mm. And it's changing that paradigm that they've been preached to that says that nobody gives a damn about them and you make that difference. So thank you for your work. Mic drop moment. Uh, and we will pick this back up again in the very near future. Thank you all very much.